So, <coughs> we've already formed a quorum, and uh, we're a little bit past the scheduled starting time. So let's move on to the agenda. Item one on the agenda, confirmation of the minutes of the meeting held on the 10th of October is paper 141. Up to this moment, the Secretariat has not received any proposal for amendment. So can we have the minutes confirmed? Thank you very much. Minutes confirmed. Item two on the agenda. Information papers issued since the meeting on the 2nd of July. Well, we have quite a long list. Perhaps uh, while I'm reading out the list, we can invite the officials to come in. Since the meeting on the 2nd of July, the Secretariat has received the following papers. LC paper numbers 1441 bracket 01, 1662 bracket 01, 1758 bracket 01, and 1868 bracket 01. Welcome, Mr. Pascott uh, and the other officials. Now, these papers contain land registry statistics for June to September 2013 provided by the administration. And then we also received paper 1534 bracket 01. Referral memorandum from the Public Complaints Office of the Legislative Council Secretariat regarding issues relating to accommodation arrangements for ethnic minorities. And then paper 1604, bracket 01, the administration's booklet on general housing policies. Paper 1696, bracket 01. Referral arising from the meeting between LegCo members and Kowloon City District Council members on the 9th of May regarding the provision of alternative fuel supply in public rental housing estates. So members, please note these papers. We now proceed to item 3 on the agenda. Items for discussion at the next meeting. Paper 184. Bracket 01, list of follow-up actions. And then paper 184, bracket 02, list of outstanding items for discussion. Members, together with the deputy chairman, I held a meeting with the bureau director and Deputy Secretary on the 28th of December and have worked out a list of outstanding items for discussion, which is actually our work plan. Those items with an asterisk involve long-term housing strategy and will therefore be discussed in the subcommittee on long-term housing strategy. So there will be a division of work. Our next meeting will be held on the 2nd of December. The administration has proposed the following items for discussion. Public housing construction program 2013-14 to 2017-18. The administration would like to brief members on the Hong Kong Housing Authority's public housing construction program for the period 2013-14 to 2017-18. The second item proposed is Head 711, Community Hall at Samoping Road, Kuntong. This is in response to members' request at the panel meeting on the 3rd of June. The administration would brief members on the Community Hall project and the updated arrangements on the reprovisioning of services of the relevant NGOs. So we'll discuss these two items at the next meeting. Are there any other suggestions? If not, for the time being, we'll have these two items. Let's proceed to item four on the agenda. The first discussion item today, analysis of housing situation of waiting list applicants as at the end of June 2013. We have three papers here. The first one is paper 1328. Bracket 01, a letter 
dated the 14th of June from Mr. Wang Yong Man on the policy on and waiting time for public rental housing allocation. The second one is paper 184 bracket 03. The administration's paper on analysis of housing situation of waiting list applicants as at the end of June 2013. So this is from the administration. And then paper 184 bracket 04. The background brief on housing situation of waiting list applicants prepared by the Lechko Secretariat. Mr. Wong Yong Man's letter is very clear. He asked that we discuss the allocation policy and waiting arrangements. And precisely, this is uh, the item for discussion today. So I've arranged for Mr. Wong Yong Man's letter and this item to be discussed together. I invite the administration to introduce the paper to us first, and then members can ask questions. Mr. Wong has raised his hand. Mr. Pescott, would you please introduce the paper to us, or whether your colleagues have any supplement? We'll do a short PowerPoint for members' uh, reference. Uh, as members know, it is the government's policy objective to provide public rental housing to low-income families who cannot afford private rental accommodation. Towards this end, the Hong Kong Housing Authority maintains a waiting list for public rental housing applicants. There are two types of applicants on the waiting list, namely general applicants, generally families, and non-elderly one-person applicants under the quota and point system. The Housing Authority's target is to maintain the average waiting time at around three years for general applicants. There is no average waiting time commitment for non-elderly one-person applicants under the quota and point system. In view of the increasing number of public rental housing applications and the public's concern over the waiting time for general waitlist applicants, in particular those applicants with a waiting time of more than three years, for the last two years, the Housing Authority has analyzed the housing situation of waitlist applicants. This exercise has been repeated for general waitlist applicants as at the end of June 2013, based on the latest available data. The analysis results show that while the Housing Authority is still able to maintain the average waiting time within the target of around three years, it is increasingly challenging to do so, given the increasing number of waiting list applicants. There is a real prospect that the average waiting time will lengthen in future. I do not need to point out how important it is that we secure additional land for the development of more public rental housing in order to meet this growing demand. I'd like to, uh, to invite the Assistant Director Anson Lai to take us through the PowerPoint presentation which gives more details on the figures which are also set out in the paper, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Lai, thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I'd like to introduce to members the situation of the waiting list at, at the end of June. As the Permanent Secretary said, Public housing is mainly for those who cannot afford private housing, and we have a general register for people to register. The average waiting time is maintained at three years, but this does not cover the non-elderly one-person applicants under the quota and point system, the QPS. In general, at the end of June this year, on the waiting list, we have around 118,000 applicants, general applicants, and 115,000-odd non-elderly one-person applications under the QPS. Now, this shows you that there has been an increase of 12 percent when compared with the end of June last year. And compared with the end of June 2011, a rise of 19 percent. And there's a huge growth in elderly applicants. When compared with last June, is 24 percent. Compared with 2011, a jump of 40 percent. Average waiting time, how do we calculate it? We start from the registration time up to the first offer. But freezing periods will not be 
included. For example, those who have not yet satisfied the requirements on the period of residence in Hong Kong, those who are waiting for family reunion, etc. In the past 12 months, uh, we take the average waiting time of those on the waiting list. So that's the basis of the pledge for an average waiting time of three years. On the waiting list, for various reasons, certain applications might have been cancelled. For example, during the stage of detailed vetting, if do the documents show that uh, access requirements, etc., or failure to attend interviews may render the application void. And during that period, the applicant concerned is ineligible, and so the waiting time will not be considered. But our computer system cannot discount that period. As at the end of June this year, for the general applicants, the average waiting time is 2.7 years, elderly 1.5 years. From this slide, you know that at the end of June, when compared with two years ago, that is 2.2 years at the end of June 2011, there was a market growth. And for elderly applicants, there's also a growth. For the time being, the HA has been able to maintain the average waiting time objective. But as the number of applicants continues to grow, the Housing Authority and Housing Department are facing greater and greater challenges. For the average waiting time, that is AWT, it shows uh, the average waiting time for PRH in the past 12 months. But the HD cannot uh, forecast future waiting time because it depends on the number of applicants. For example, if the PRH units recovered, the choice of districts of the applicants, etc., will impact on the waiting time of individual applicants. As you all understand, as the number of applicants is ever growing, that will impact hugely on the waiting time. The number of PRH units to be constructed in the next few years has already been determined by and large. Our analysis consists of two parts. The first part is the average figure uh, in relation to the 14,300 general applicants housed between tw July 2012 and June 2013 in 118,700 general applicants still on the waiting list as at the end of June 2013. But I want to emphasize that this is just an average figure of waiting time for all housed applicants in the past 12 months, and some might inevitably have waited for over three years. For, so the first analysis seeks to provide supplementary information. As this is an average figure, and to address members of the public's concern and members' concern, we provide the information as in A, and as in B, uh, that means for um, general applicants still on the waiting list after registration for three years, we conduct a more detailed analysis. The observations um, are that 56% of the general applicants housed during the period received the first offer within three years. This is in line with the target of 2.7 years for general applicants. Now, as at the end of June this year, for applicants still on the waiting list, 16% of them have, have waited for three years or more and have yet to receive any offer. However, half of them or almost half of them have already reached the detailed investigation stage and would be given an offer soon if they're eligible. This table in the slide more or less provides the gist of the table set out in the paper for members' reference. Between July last year and June this year, among the 14,300 of the uh, housed general applicants, this pro table provides the details. So um, I won't go into details. And uh, just to conclude, from last July to June this year, for the 14,300 ap general applicants housed, 
40% of them received the first offer within two years, and 56 of them received the first offer within three years. So the target of 2.7 years could be reached. In relation to the general applicants receiving the first offer after three years, there are around 6,300 of them. And according to our analysis, about 52% opted for flats in the urban districts, whereas 39% opted for flats in the extended urban district. Although they received the first offer after three years, most of them receive um, the first offer of around 30, uh, three to four years. That's 54% of them, and 32% of them around four to five years. And uh, um, uh, in respect of household size, 68% of them were two-person or three-person households. Now, for those waiting for over five years or above, the general applicants housed after five years, that is. We checked the records to find out the reasons for the long waiting time. And the reasons of these cases involve special circumstances. Some may involve a number of uh, special circumstances, for example, change of um, household particulars and uh, supporting documents might be required and the waiting time might have to do with uh, uh, the time needed for the uh, documents. And some refused to accept housing offers and some applications were cancelled, perhaps in the detailed vetting stage. Uh, at once, the household could meet the income eligibility requirements, but uh, subsequently they failed to meet the requirements, and we did not uh, exclude these uh, cases. Now, for the general applicants housed, I already covered the analysis. And let me say something about the 118,700 general applicants still on the waiting list as at the end of June this year. 16% of them, around 19,200 applicants, waited for three years or above without any flat offer as uh, at the end of June this year. And the time, uh, ex the waiting time excludes the frozen period. Again, this is extracted from the information in the paper, so I won't go through them in detail. I'd like to share with you our major observations. Among the uh, 19,200 general applicants waiting for three years or above without any um, offer, as at the end of June, around half of them already reached the investigation stage, and they will be uh, given an offer soon if they are eligible. As for the remaining ones, we find that most of them have opted for flats in the urban and extended urban districts. And uh, about the 19,200 general applicants still wait to be housed. Around 70% opted for the urban district, 19% opted for the extended urban district, and 56% of them waited for three to four years. 33 of them waited for four to five years, and about 70% of them are three to four person households. And uh, like I said just now, for those waiting for five years or above, we'd like to know and find out the reasons why, and we conducted a special analysis. And they involve special circumstances, including change of household particulars, refusal to accept housing offers, etc. Apart from these two analyses, we understand that um, the public is also concerned about frozen time. Some applicants might have experienced frozen time whilst on the waiting list for various reasons. Around 5,830 applications on the waiting list as 5% were frozen among the 118,700 general applicants on the waiting list. As seen uh, in this table, some, um, some uh, may have experienced frozen period because of residence requirement. Some might uh, be due to um, other reasons. And although the periods have been frozen, we still allow the applicants to remain on the waiting list. Although they might not have meet, met all the eligibility criteria for PRH application, we allow them to be registered and given higher priority in the queue. And uh, because 
they would like to they are likely to perceive the frozen time as part of the waiting time they might um have the perception that uh, they are waiting longer than others now overall observations for cases involving longer waiting times they mostly involve two or three person households opting for the urban or extended urban districts the ki- the situation is similar for those still on the waiting list um, not yet housed and there might also be other uh, special reasons or special circumstances causing the long waiting time about the 14,300 general applicants housed 44% of them about 6,300 applicants received the first offer after 3 years as at the end of june 19,200 general applicants are still on the waiting list with the waiting time of 3 years or above without any flat offer So the result shows the difficulties for the HA to maintain the AWT target of around three years. It's becoming more and more difficult. So much for the waiting list, and may I say something about the supply of flats to address the demand. Uh, the the uh, supply mostly come from new housing production and recovery of PRH uh, flats. Um, Now, um, about tackling abuse of PRH every year, uh, some seven thousand flats could be recovered for reallocation. New production is also a major source. This table shows you the projection from twenty thirteen fourteen to twenty seventeen eighteen. So, as you can see. We try to increase the number of units produced, but every year the housing production might be affected by uh, factors such as uh, land supply. For new housing productions, around 20% of them would be one two-person units. 25% would be two three-person units. Around 40% would be one-bedroom u- units for three or four persons. And we hope that the new supply could be able to meet the demand in the urban and the extended urban areas. And uh, some flats might be larger, and we hope to meet the demand for uh, larger households. Uh, say two to four urban uh, person households in urban and extended urban districts, and we also adopt different measures such as uh, under occupation of PRH flats and tackling abuse of PRH to recover more flats for reallocation. So, in conclusion, we will continue to keep in view the number of applications on the waiting list and maintain an AWT at around three years for general applicants on the waiting list. Despite our efforts. As members could see, the the number of、um, applicants are increasing, and、uh, some new PRH flats are being produced. In the coming few years, the number is almost fixed. So, it will exert great pressure on maintaining the target if the number of applicants keep rising. We will try to、um, tackle、uh, abuse of PRH flats and.、Uh, To recover more flats, and but on the whole, we also need to、um, increase land supply for more housing production. Thank you, Pre- uh, Mr. Lai Yacheng, Assistant Director, presented the、uh, PowerPoint to us, and、uh, we have other representatives from the administration. Mr. Duncan Pascot, Permanent Secretary for Transport and Housing; Ms. Agnes Wong, Deputy Secretary for Transport and Housing; and Mr. Michael Lee, Chief Housing Manager from the Housing Department. So, we have Dr. Fernando Chan, Christopher Jung, Vincent Fang, Raymond Wong, and、uh, Lee Chak Yan, Ko Ka Ki, and Lan Kwa Hong. Who else would like to speak? Tony Chair. So four minutes each. Questions and answers included. Dr. Fernando Jung, please. Thank you, Chairman. Well, having heard the administration's presentation, it seems that、um, the the waiting time of three years is actually a rose-tinted picture. There are actually two queues. So for the non-elderly singleton applicants, they are excluded. For normal households, they are not housed within three years. They are only given an offer within three years. The 
offer may not be suitable for them. And there is also the EAFS, Express Flat Allocation Schemes, flats which are undesirable, flats which um, uh, in which um, murder cases happened before, and these flats are also included. The period starts at a time when the blue card was received, not the date of application. It might take um, almost half a year before you receive a blue card after registration. So, on average, almost half of the applicants could not be um, housed within three years. And as clearly sh shown here, that 44% of the applicants waited for more than three years. So my question is this. In relation to the different processes for different applicants, for example, non-elderly, single, singleton applicants, from the time when they filed the application to when they received the blue card to the um, any housing offer under the EFAS or um, the first official offer and when they fi are finally housed, can you give us all this information to have more transparency so that we know exactly how long, um, on average, a household would need to wait. The long-term housing strategy steering committee uh, is uh, setting a target of 470,000 with a public-private mix of 6 to 4. So uh, there will be around uh, 220, uh, 232,000 PRH units. Now there are 234,000 applicants on the waiting list. That means those on the waiting list will already exceed the housing projection for the coming 10 years. So how can you maintain the uh, three-year target, Mr. Pascot? Um, I must point out, we did put this in the paper, that we don't just look at the new housing production. On top of the new housing production, we have a number of flats every year that are recycled. So the, the total that's available at any one time is new production plus the recycled. And at the moment, it's running at about 22,000 per annum. That's 15,000 plus 7,000. Um, on top of that, of course, as we start in the program on home ownership scheme, uh, assumption is that roughly 50% of the home ownership scheme units are taken up by people in the um, public housing, either tenants or, or people on the waiting list. So there's another group that will come out. So taking all that into account, uh, we believe that the 470,000 actually does uh, provide the sufficient accommodation for us first to maintain, if we can, the three-year waiting time on average for those people on the general waiting list, as well as to accommodate all of the other factors as well including people living in inadequate housing, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So the 470 has taken into account all of these figures. Um, going back to the first question, uh, it's actually rather difficult to give you the, 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 the elapsed time for each of those stages because it depends on the individual applicant, whether they have the documentation at the time when they apply, because that's one of the determining factors as to whether they get their blue card quickly or not. So it's, it's actually very difficult to give you an absolute timetable for each of those stages. Um, that's why for many, many years now we've taken the average waiting time as the most representative way to, to document those, uh, the waiting time for members on the, on the general waiting list. In that case, can they give us the PRH supply and demand for the next decade? Yes, Mr. Pascot, can we have the information? Given you the figures for the next five years, I can also add that beyond the next five years, the challenge at this stage by, from government to the housing authority is to produce 100,000 units. So over the next 10-year period, it will be 179,000 roughly to be produced. Now, let me stress that does not yet take into account the additional figures that will have to be produced if we're to meet the 470,000 or the public housing share of that. But the committed figures, the figures for which I have the land or I'm already building, it's 179,000. Mr. Christopher Chong, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I can't say that they are deceiving us, but from these statistics, 
Those who've already got a PRH flat won't come to us. For those who've waited for three years, they'll come to us. And then we see that there are many of them, over 40 percent of them. That's very dangerous. And just now in their presentation, they're saying that they might even be able to guard this line of 2.7 years. So the absolute figures are huge in terms of waiting or the number of waiting applicants. I believe these figures are not detailed enough. Above three years, 3.5 years, four years, 4.5 years, five years, and above five years, how many applicants do we have? Because in hand, I have a number of cases who've waited for more than four years. Now, if councillors have cases exceeding three years, uh, should we approach Mr. Lee? Because he's the boss of his staff members. And then there's another breakdown figure. For one, two P households, uh, three, four P households, uh, the bigger flats for six P's or above. For these different categories, was the waiting time. Now, these figures will be meaningful as well because, as frontliners, we may need to explain to these applicants that uh, there are too few flats of a particular category. So, if councillors do not have these detailed breakdowns, they will not be able to explain to the public why they've been waiting for more than three years. And then some PRH tenants have received a slip uh, to inform them that their family size had shrunken, so they should move to smaller flats. There are so many of these people coming to us, uh, particularly the elderly tenants. They're very worried that they have, uh, they might have to move out of their existing flats. So your breakdowns would be very useful to us. Three questions we will answer. The, the distribution of waiting time is actually set out in the paper. If you look at paragraph 15, there's a detailed table there, um, which breaks it down as you've, as you've described. So I think the information is already there. Um, in terms of the, um, the different categories, again, we've broken it down by 1P, 2P, etc. And also, we've broken it down by different district, because one of the keys here is that uh, the longer waiting time frankly, has to be in the urban area, because that's where the majority of people want their, to, to, to be accommodated. So we've given you a breakdown by urban, extended urban, new territories and uh, islands. So I think the, the details should be there. And if you need any more information for talking to the public, we'll, we'll happily uh, try and provide that. Um, in terms of um, the last question, the over-accommodation, um, the Housing Authority's policy is to um, basically try and uh, encourage people to move out of large flats, if there's only one person living in a flat that would accommodate four or five, six people, it clearly is, a, is a, an underutilization of that very, very precious resource. As you can see, the larger families are waiting longer. We need those big flats back. So we, we're trying to encourage them. But frankly, at the end of the day, um, we also have a, to balance the interests of the elderly, as you quite rightly said. So the policy there is that for um, elderly tenants over 70, we basically say we're not touching them. For those over 60, we're encouraging them, but we're not forcing them out. Because we understand... Well, but you are raising that age limit to 70. Originally, it was 60. Seven, it's all never been 60. What we've done is introduce this system where we will not be forcing 60-year-olds out. Previously, we would, have, we would have been taking action against them, but that's already been changed most recently. So that policy has changed. Maybe after the meeting you can give us more breakdowns. Well, Mr. Christopher Chong would like to know the waiting time for the different categories of flats, 2P, 4P, etc., etc. Ms. Wong? I think Mr. Chong also understands that for the one room flat, it can be for up to three to four persons. And for two room flats, they can be given to households up to five to six members. And for a family exceeding eight members, 
will try as far as possible to give them at least two rooms. So it's very difficult to provide those breakdowns. It really depends on the family composition. Well, a 4P household may be willing to accept a one-room flat. Mr. Vincent Fang. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. These figures are rather confusing to me. It seems that now there is this trend that students above the age of 18 and who are still at school also come forward to apply for PRH. Is this a fact? Because uh, these students have been told that they might lose out if they don't apply now. So if that is a trend, the number of applicants will further grow. As for the frozen periods, over 5,800 cases, but for 5,600 of these cases, they've not just satisfied the residency requirement. Does that mean that these applicants are actually not eligible yet? So they shouldn't be excluded. They should wait till they're eligible. Otherwise, they'll be boosting the overall figures. And then you would like to increase the number of recovered flats. In the paper, you say that for over 9,400 flats, the water tariffs were rather low or really at the level of zero you only recovered about 11 to 12 percent of these flats, about 1,200 odd. So why have you let the other households off the hook? You recovered 490. Why is the recovery rate so low? Now, most applicants would like to have uh, flats in the urban areas or extended urban areas. Most of them, I believe, uh, are three to four P households. Well, if uh, every of these applicants wants to have uh, a flat in the urban areas or extended urban areas and there are three to four P, how can you solve the problem? The students first. Um, we understand that some students, when they're doing their you know, first freshers' week, are encouraged to apply as soon as they hit 18. Um, the reality is, of course, we can't stop them applying. But uh, one of the recommendations in the long-term housing strategy uh, steering committee's report is that we should review the current composition of the quota and point system, because. Those people who graduate, for example, uh, from universities, fairly quickly they will exceed our income level and, uh, without any doubt, or at least they should expect to, um, and therefore would probably not qualify by the time they become eligible. So this is something we're going to look at, and we're, we're studying how that can be done. But we, I must point out, of course, that is a particular category. Not all 18-year-olds who apply are in that category, and th there will be some who will inevitably still qualify after five or six years, we need to allow them to continue to apply. So we need to look at a way to remove that first category. Um, the frozen period, uh, as you quite rightly pointed out, 5,000 odd of those currently on the, on the list are not yet eligible. That's why they're frozen. Uh, however, their eligibility could change quite quickly. For example, some of them may be waiting for a family member to come in uh, they may be waiting for a baby. If they have a baby here, they become eligible. So it, th there are many, many reasons why they are, they're not currently eligible, and we feel it's, it's acceptable to carry them. After all, in, in 18, 180,000, 5,000 isn't going to make that much difference. But we do keep a, a close eye on those. Um, in terms of recovered flats, um, we actually carry out a number of exercises. The water meter reading is one telltale sign that someone may not be occupying the flat in the way they should be. It's not the only piece of evidence that we would need, but it is a trigger for us to investigate in more detail. Um, because, of course, it is legitimate for people to travel. They can go overseas on holidays, all of these sort of things. We need to have a, a much more formal investigation to determine whether or not someone is actually 
uh, living in that property or not. So it's a trigger rather more than sufficient evidence for us to take action. Uh, and indeed, it's not the only trigger. Well, there are others which I don't particularly want to get into here that we look at as a, as a methodology to identify those people that are, um, that are not occupying the property properly. Um, finally, um, flats in the urban and extended urban, yes, those are, tend to be the most popular. Um, and indeed, this is something when we review the, the flat production mix, depending on where the sites we get, which obviously we don't control necessarily, we will then determine what is the flat mix within that particular site of development. So that, as you can see, we will be building some two bedrooms which are designed for bigger families. But as, as um, uh, Agnes has pointed out, for larger families, eight plus, we can give them two flats, perhaps, as a way to... I I'll end. Well, Permanent Secretary, I think you have to end there. Time is running out. And members, when you ask questions, you have to take into account that the officials have to reply. We have so many members waiting to ask questions. Four minutes each. Next, Mr. Wong Yong Man. Mr. Chairman, I divide my questions into two parts. I submitted a question to you via a letter, and thank you, Chairman, for arranging this discussion. Of course, I understand that this issue would be discussed anyway, irrespective of my letter, because councillors, what officers received a lot of cases seeking assistance. Now, we are told that the average waiting time stands at 2.7 years, but in future, this will be very difficult to be maintained. Mr. 689 promised a lot of PRH flats, and now he is running a game of figures. Now we are told that they can at present maintain the average waiting time is three years, but in future, they're under huge pressure to maintain that. Given the pace of PRH production at the moment, the waiting time will only be lengthened. As far as we can see, in the foreseeable future, at least in the next 10 years, the problem will not be able to be solved. Every year we can rediscuss the issue, but there's no way out. All right, let me respond to uh, the methodology stated in your paper, and um, perhaps we can discuss some issues. Let's look at this figure, 115,600 for non-elderly one-person applicants under the QPS. They are not supported by the family. They also urgently need to be housed. Even if the target of three years doesn't apply to them, at least you should think from their perspective. We're talking about over 100,000 people. The second point, paragraph 7, average waiting time for general applicants 2.7 years, for elderly one-person applicants 1.5 years. This figure doesn't tally with the complaints received by councillors at their ward offices. I won't start to uh, argue with you on the, the facts, but at le least there are many families waiting for um, over three years without any offer. That's true. And the other point is uh, in relation to the average of waiting time of general applicants in the pa uh, house in the past 12 months, and uh, the uh, frozen period is excluded. And then it says there will inevitably be applicants whose waiting times exceed three years. But some applicants might wait for six or even seven years. So if this is just an average figure, of 2.7 years, then for these unfortunate cases of having three to four, five or six or seven years of waiting time, can you be more flexible in following up on the cases? What we feel is that you're being too rigid. You're just showing us the methodology. Please allow them some time to answer. No need. I'll just give them some suggestions. Please don't be so rigid. Please take a special uh, approach to these cases. And uh, some other points I'd like to make. Frozen period, 5,000 
590 cases in relation to the residence requirement. Now, a few days ago at the LegCo, uh, we had a heated debate. There was a divide between the pan-democratic uh, members. Some said that uh, we should not allow new arrivals to come, and uh, we should be uh, able to get the approval authority. And if uh, the if the new arrivals come to settle in Hong Kong, they should be regarded as Hong Kong residents. The point is, we cannot stop people from coming, and we cannot stop them from coming to Hong Kong to settle. And this affects housing policy. Your time is up. So. Uh, administration, please take note of Mr. Raymond Wong's comment. Mr. Kwok Wai Kang. Thank you, Chairman. Just now, Assistant Director Mr. Lai made a detailed presentation and explanation on the average waiting time of three years and some exceptional cases um, whose waiting time exceeds three years. But the figure is very clear. Out of um, 118,700, some 5,000 experienced frozen period. So at least 11, uh, 113,000 applicants are still on the waiting list. So if the three-year target is to be maintained, then every year 30 or 40 units should be produced in order to um, balance the book. That's why FTU uh, has made the suggestion of producing 30 to 40 units per year to, in order to meet the um, uh, three-year target. But now there is still a shortfall in terms of the supply projected. So how can the administration be able to meet the target in order to maintain the three-year waiting time? First question. Second question, Permanent Secretary. Please try your best to clarify the situation. The uh, saying of an average waiting time of 2.7 years is actually causing us to suffer a lot because we, um, electrical members and district councils, receive a lot of complaints about uh, waiting for more than three years. And we explained at length about the average waiting time. In fact, the administration used this kind of methodology with so many exceptions in order to come up with the average figure of 2.7. Well, there are 70% um, of uh, those uh, waiting on the the uh, waiting list for more than three years, and uh, they opt for uh, urban district and extended urban district, and that's the reason why they are not housed within three years. So please explain to them ca uh, clearly. Now, on 14,300 general applicants housed, only 2,300 of them are 3P, 4P household. For those waiting for more than three years who are in 3 or 4P household, there are one. Uh, there are ten thousand or so. So uh, there is a great difference here. Are we talking about four p or five p household, and you don't welcome them, and you or, or you're not going to help them um, with uh, housing offer as soon as possible? For four p five p household, few flats have been allocated. So how? Can you integrate housing policy with population policy to encourage people of Hong Kong to uh, bear children and set up families? The, uh, the, the suggested target of 30,000, 40,000, um, as I say, the, the revised target, which um, the, the government's already announced, is 20,000 plus the recycle. So we're already working in the second five year period to around 27, 28,000. The question now is, in the long-term housing strategy, what will be the new target? It's, it's obviously going to be much above that, so that, that's something that we will be working on. In terms of the shortfall of supply and how are we going to meet those targets, honestly, as I said in my introduction, it's about building more and building as quickly as we can, because without additional units, we won't be able to meet these targets. And that's why we're working so hard to secure every piece of land that we possibly can, because we understand that the, the public are waiting for these units. The people are, are in poor living conditions. They need the accommodation. So we're definitely doing that. Um, on the large family issue, uh, this is something that we've been uh, following for a, a while now. And as I said, we do actually allocate maybe two units to a larger family to get them in 
quicker if they're prepared to accept that. And we are now building a, some more larger units so that we can uh, provide units for those, for those people in that, that category. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Oh. So, Wuchi, why, Deputy Chairman? Thank you, Chairman. A lot of colleagues already mentioned this in relation to 4P households on the waiting list. They could hardly get any offer within the period stated, and the waiting time has been affected. Now, in 2009 and 2010, the administration reviewed the housing production in the urban area uh, because of increase in supply. The administration allowed the applicants to opt for uh, from extended urban districts to urban districts as well. So I'd like to know the basis of your um, review or change in policy. Do you know that there is a discrepancy here so that for 4P households, they need to wait longer? Second point. Well, we understand that uh, people would like to live in the urban districts, but those with pressing housing needs must get this information so that they don't opt for urban or extended urban districts and waste a lot of time waiting. In the coming five years, when the production is more or less fixed, in relation to 1, 2P, 2, 3P or 4, uh, 3, 4P households, will you announce to the public those figures in supply in the urban districts so that when the information becomes more transparent, the public can make adjustments and um, make um, alternative choices so that they can be housed instead of waiting longer for flats in the urban districts, which um, in fact, very few or doesn't even exist. Who would like to take this question? Agnes Wong. Now, uh, the two exercises. We understood that many applicants preferred urban districts, and we understood that there might be supply of flats in the urban districts, and the subsidized uh, housing uh, committee of the Housing Authority endorsed this proposal and issued letters to applicants telling them that if they would like to opt for urban districts, this is an opportunity for them. But we also made it clear that it, do it doesn't mean they had to choose uh, the urban districts. Um, it doesn't mean that uh, their waiting time would be shorter because of uncertainties. We're not, we were not sure how many of them would uh, change their choices, and we were not sure how many units in the urban districts would be recovered. We did make it clear, however, that if applicants prefer a certain district, they could opt for urban districts, but we didn't guarantee that the waiting time would be shorter. We received feedback that the information was not clear enough, and subsequently we did make it clear in similar circumstances that about a certain number of units would come onto stream in the urban district, and uh, it might be clearer for them to assess the situation and make their own choices. So, sorry, Chairman. I think the um, key of the question is about the category. There is no information on the category or size of flats in relation to the flats allocated on the waiting list, for example, uh, 124,000 in the new territories might have received housing offer. But what about the breakdowns? The type uh, of uh, house uh, flats or types of uh, households, this information should be given. If you tell them to go to the extended urban um, district or the new territories, uh, the waiting time may be shorter. But in fact, this is not transparent enough. You should tell people on the queue uh, this information for them to. Um, in, in fact, I, th I take the point. I think we, we do need to be a little bit more um, detailed as far as we can. The problem, of, of course, is it's not just about new units. People can opt for the recycled units that are coming up in various districts. We don't control that. So it, it, I don't want to mislead people by thinking it's only the new units. We have to have both. However, having said that, we will try and provide more information on the, 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 the coming program of new production so that people can have a better feeling for where they are. Okay. Thank you, Chairman. 
The Hong Kong XR government isn't the first to manipulate figures. Mark Twain once said, lies, damn lies, and statistics. So he made that statement. Yeah, you use it a lot, too, so you know how statistics, statistics lies. Um, Ours don't, of course. <laughs> you, yours also. Oh, please uh, refrain from having a conversation here. Not a conversation. I'd like to ask for some information. First point, a quick question. Quick answer, please. I'd like to, to have uh, make, make some points. Now, out of the 14,300, are we talking about those receiving first offer? Not actually house, but first offer. Uh, we understand that there is a difference here. Who would like to take this question? 14,300, whether it's about first offer. That means they may not be uh, housed yet. Uh, so those receiving first offer and housed. So that's the case, is it? Housed, actually housed after having uh, given the first offer. Now, less than one year, I see that there are 1,500. Is it compassionate rehousing? Well, if it's not necessarily compassionate housing, then there are quite a number of them. Some 600 of them out of the 1,500 in the urban district could be housed. But you just told us that uh, the people needed to wait for five or six years for urban districts. However, here, less than one year, I see that uh, the, um, there are the largest number of them in the... As I said before, the, the issue is about where people are applying for and where the units are available. So, for example, if we have a large family that's applying for the urban area and we happen to have a large flat, obviously we're going to be able to allocate that to the, to the large family first, even though there are other people in the queue, because we try to match. So that we, we will always have these anomalies, but generally we follow the, 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 the list as it produces itself. So that's, that's the way it works. Sorry, speaker's not coming through. No re, uh, compassionate rehousing is involved, and uh, that's excluded from the average waiting time of three years. That explains why, if the applicant takes the first offer, he will be housed sooner. So the so-called express housing or compassionate housing or the EFAS scheme, how many cases among these uh, are under the EFAS? Well, this figure excludes uh, these cases under EFAS. The EFAS is conducted once every year. The first offer is randomly given by the computer. If the applicant takes the first offer, then there is uh, a chance that uh, he can be housed sooner. So we can't say whether the first or second offer is better. It depends on the computer system. It also depends on whether the applicant takes up the offer. So the wish of the applicant also is a crucial factor. In that case, 8,000 below three years of. So next time will be 19,000 waiting for more than three years who have not yet got a flat. A flat. So if you say the AWT is 2.7 years, you actually include uh, those so-called express cases. You took the average uh, and arrived at 2.7. But most of the complaint cases we got uh, are related to those who are not actually given a flat. At the end of the day, you don't rely on building more PRH flats to tackle the problem. You're actually solving the problem by way of tackling abuses. And every year you have to recover 7,000 units if you're to solve the problem. Would that be disturbing the incumbent tenants? And for those who cannot pay rent, Will you, will you be exerting pressure on them? And this is actually a disturbance, a nuisance to the tenants. Of course, the, the 7,000 that we recycle is from various different sources. People die, people emigrate, uh, 
families move out and find their own accommodation because they move into the private sector or HOS. So many, many reasons why, why we recycle around 7,000. And again, that's the average. Some years, when we've had home ownership scheme sales, we've had over 12,000 recycled. So that you can't make that analogy, I'm afraid. Can you give us uh, details in writing about the distribution of these 7,000 recovered flats? Yes. Dr. Kwakaki, Mr. Chairman, I trust Mr. Pascott and his team do not tell lies. They've been very prudent in their action. 243,000 on the general waiting list and 1P waiting list. But only 100,000 flats in the next 10 years. So altogether, you get 230 odd thousand plus the 7,000 recovered units and 25,000 HOS flats. At most, you get 325,000 flats. You already have 230,000 waiting. So every year you have 34 to 44,000 new applicants. Multiply that by 10 will be 340 to 440,000 on the waiting list. So those at the end of the queue may have to wait for 23 years. Today, if somebody submits an application, for how long does he have to wait? Well, if you continue to say that the average waiting time is three years, you're actually deceiving the public and those who are waiting. You want to use, you want to hypnotize us, or you want to hypnotize yourselves. Now the figures are in front of us. Well, frankly, tell us, uh, if you have 230,000 waiting, waiting, how long do they have to wait? The three-year waiting time only applies to the general waiting list. That's about 118,000 currently. Well, I have limited time. Mr. Pascot, 118,000. If you use up all your resources, including the recovered units, those at the end of the queue, for how many years do they have to wait? Just tell me frankly. Mr. Chairman, I've uh, done some calculation. It's nine years. Well, let him wait. Don't answer the question on behalf of him. Mr. Chairman, can I answer? Thank you. As I said, yes, you can answer, Mr. Pescott. If you apply today, on average, your waiting time will be about three years. That's what the figures quite clearly show. Mr. Chairman, let me ask another question. To complete the queue, to handle the queue, 118,000, how much time will you need? That is to process the 118,000. Simple matter of simply getting rid of a queue because every single family who's applying on that queue has their own individual circumstances. And we've explained, there are people who have frozen time, there are people who have periods where they're not able to take up offers, they're included in this queue. If I was to say a person comes onto the queue, applies today, on average he's gonna wait three years, that's, that's as best as I can do in the, the information I have. Mr. Chairman, I haven't seen officials who are more Shameless. They're just repeating their answers. Well, let me ask you another question. Can you confirm that it is a lie to say that the waiting time is three years? Give them a few seconds to answer the question. Well, I'll let Mr. Pascot answer the question, but please let Mr. Pascot finish his answer, whether or not you're satisfied with his answer. They speak for themselves. They are the facts as we see them today. 
There's no question of anyone lying. We're trying to provide the information that we have that we're sharing with members. Simple as that. Oh. Mr. Long Kwok Hong, Mr. Chairman, there is this expression in English, compulsory liar. I think the government and Mr. Pascott understand this expression very much. Partial truth is a lie. Very simple. Let me ask you a simple question. Number one, can you upgrade your computer software? How complicated is it? In how many cases you fail to have breakdowns just because of your computer systems? Well, we can give you money to update your computer systems. We ask you for breakdowns, but you are unable to provide them. Is it because of manpower shortage or because of the low level of your computer systems? And then there is this expression of jack of all trades but master of none. It's you. Your answers have been very tactful. Now, 44%, you said, did not get a flat in three years' time. So, do you admit that this is a failure? And then secondly, you're very cunning. We asked about 2012-13. All right, for that year, the average is 2.7 years. 2.7 is so beautiful a figure for 2012-13. That means the applicants of the other years are suffering. So it's not meaningful to just tell us the figures for July 2012 to June 2013. You are just playing with figures. All right, there are flats in the urban areas. Please come and apply for them, but if they don't get a flat, they will change the figures from July 2012 to June 2013. You did some calculation and arrived at 2.7 years. When did you start to have uh, this particular year for calculations such that you can come up with this beautiful figure of 2.7. And then for 2013-14, you have many, many flats produced. But the applications may be frozen because of various reasons. Well, if I wait for five years, tell me, long hair? Now I give you a concession. Mr. Leung, you can leave some time for them to answer your question. Oh, I won't leave time for them to answer my questions. Your st statistical analysis is not satisfactory. You're trying to work out beautiful figures for us. Frankly speaking, if I'm your professor, I won't give you any mark. The more beautiful this figure for 2012-13 is, the more uglier the other figures for the other years are. My introduction were first calculated back in uh, 2011, and the figures are produced. And the, the worrying thing from my point of view is that actually the waiting time is increasing, and it does worry me. That's why we're putting so much pressure on getting additional units. So this isn't something we've created just for this year. We've been reporting this to the Housing Authority Subsidised Housing Committee for three years, and they're monitoring this very closely, Mr. Chairman. So what, uh, explain, um, what, what is the methodology? Members, we still have four members waiting, excluding me. And we've still another agenda item to go. So, members, please grasp your time well. Second round, Dr. Fernando Chang, sorry, I cannot let you ask for a second time. Mr. Tony Zhe, 
AWT for PRH has been lengthened in the past two years. You now have 230,000 odd. About 115,000 are under the QPS or non-elderly 1P applicants. Now, Mr. Wang Yong Man has asked about them. Do you have any objective, I mean target waiting time for this category of applicants? For the general applicants is three years. Secondly, for those on the waiting list, when they apply, you carry out simple vetting to make sure that they're eligible. Is that the case? I just want to clarify that. Thirdly, for the way ahead, we of course should support their effort in combating abuse of resources. How are you going to make sure that more people will hand back their PRH flats to you? For those who are capable to purchase HOS flats, what will you do to encourage them to do so? Mr. Peskett. The first one, um, for the quota and point system, uh, in fact, the long-term housing strategy has recommended that we extend the three-year waiting list progressively to the people on the quota and point system based on their age. So uh, the, the idea would be that uh, those above 45, we would first apply the three years, then, then 40, then 35, and so on. Um, and that's something that we're considering at the moment to see how that could be done. Uh, I should point out for the younger people, their circumstances quite often change. So they may apply as a singleton, but then they get married and they have a family, suddenly they're in the other list. So for younger people, it's not quite, a, it's not quite the same approach at all. Uh, in terms of the second uh, question, the, um, uh, the, the basic vetting is, is just, just to, to establish that they have all the, the, you know, the, the basic criteria. The detailed vetting is carried out at the point where they come to be eligible for an allocation, and that's when we carry out the detailed vetting. Um, in terms of the, the third item, uh, steps to combat um, the abuse of resources, uh, in fact, we have a, a special duties team that is detailed to look at abuse of resources. Uh, we've put in place a reporting system uh, whereby tenants can report uh, any suspected abuse, be it um, subletting, uh, using a, a unit for commercial or other pro improper purposes, not living in the units and this special unit will then follow up. In addition to which, we do carry out uh, a visit to each tenant once every two years to try to, to determine first that they are using it, the right people are registered and what have you. So there's a whole process, which I don't particularly want to get into, into detail here, but we are stepping up that process to look at, um, for example, uh, readings of the um, water meters as a particular uh, piece of evidence to suggest this may or may not be an abuse of flats. So that there are various measures that we're taking, Mr. Chairman. The Chairman, Mr. Pasco just explained about non-general applicants. And they, it seems they do have a target in mind. Uh, the target may not uh, have been formed, but can you say, give us a timetable and see when this target can be given? Um, because at the moment we're still consulting on the long-term housing strategy, and we'll, once that's done, we'll then have a, a number of decisions that government and the community has to make, not least about the production numbers. Any estimated timetable? The end of the consultation period is December 2nd, but how long it'll take us thereafter, I honestly can't say at this stage. Mr. Lang Yuchong. Thank you, Chairman. Chairman, Mr. Lang Kuo Hong, uh, was right. We cannot uh, crystallize any period uh, um, to look at the figures because the uh, demand and supply vary varies. Now you talked about fourteen thousand three hundred applicants housed last year. Well, the figure t uh, tend to be on the high side because of uh, fifteen thousand plus units available. But during some years, perhaps only uh, eleven thousand or so, or twelve thousand or so, could be um, could be produced together with uh, flats recovered, so that demand um, is high while supply is uh, less. So we can we should not um, pinpoint a particular year. Now, in the coming five years, I am pessimistic. 
well, I said uh, just now, you can see that in the coming five years, on average, it's only 16,000 or so produced per year. Together with 7,000 recovered flats altogether, just 23,000. We have 230,000 on the waiting list. That means only half could be housed. For general applicants, I can say on average, they are housed within five years. So definitely, the the uh, supply is uh, far from sufficient, and for singletons, they need to be housed as well. So we must resolve the problem. Yes, more units will be produced, and according to your paper, it seems that more or less the number is fixed for the coming five years. But how can we um, manage demand, for example, for singletons? How many of them are one of the mem uh, or a member of a PRH household? For example, you have the well off tenant policy and other policies under the HA that f actually force them to queue up again. Can you review this policy so that these families won't need to uh, split up and so that you can manage demand, Mr. Pascal? Um, the figures for five years, you're right, are fairly set because it takes a five-year period from construction to completion. Um, and that's why, really, the, the target must be to put a lot of effort into the following five years so that within the 10-year period we can boost production. And it, it comes down to land supply, absolutely. If we can get more land, then I, I think we have the resources to build more. That's why we're getting additional manpower and what have you. So we're, we're gearing up to do that. In terms of um, the, uh, the demand from singletons, um, as I say, we're starting this process to look at how we can extend the waiting time uh, commitment to them as well. But we're also looking at the other side of the equation, which is, is, is it actually a fact that everybody on that waiting list would first qualify or, or is in fact in need of, of housing? So this is um, something that we're going to have to look at. Uh, to be honest with you, I think particularly for younger singleton applicants, their circumstances change quite quickly over a period of, say, three or four or five years. As I said, they may get married, they may have families and what have you. So their eligibility when they actually come up to being considered for allocation often changes, but they don't inform us. So we need to look at how can we take them off the list so that the list actually reflects actual demand, and then that actual demand, how can we apply the three-year waiting time? So that's the process we're going through. And you've quite rightly pointed out, we need to look at where are those singletons applying from? Are they currently public housing tenants? Are they living in subdivided units? What are their circumstances? So we're, we're going to do that. You're going to conduct a review, right? Mr. Albert Chen, Chairman, about the waiting list. District councillors understand ser how serious this problem is. I have been engaged in the, uh, district work for two decades, and recently I have received uh, so many complaints. They have to do with extended urban districts. Uh, they have to do with um, either 1, 2P, or 5 or 6P. For 5 or 6P households, the situation is even more serious. And that is also reflected in your set of figures. We understand that there is great pressure on the PRH waiting list. There are uh, 80,000 80, or 90,000 on the list, and it takes four or five years at least. Uh, so all the figures are, are clearly shown, but I really hope the director could uh, look carefully at this. One is that the, the system itself is unfair. For singletons, the waiting time is long, even for five or six P households. Well, because of the large family size, they face social, uh, they face pressure as well. But yet you have few flats to supply to larger families, and it's difficult to allocate large flats for large households. That causes a longer waiting time for them, and they suffer more under this system. That's because of the flaw in the system. This. Uh, category suffers more. So administratively, I don't know whether you have any measures to deal with them. I talked about, uh, I, I wrote to you earlier on, I talked about larger families or uh, transferred uh, 
households. Well, in the past, they were given two bedroom uh, flats, for example, two or two flats uh, rather, so that the six or seven P households can have two flats each, uh, two hundred or three hundred square feet. But then there is only one uh, uh, householder. Uh, so can you have a similar system in terms of uh, allocation so as to? Do away with unfairness. As for extended urban districts, if you ask them to go to urban districts or go to the new territories, they are willing to go there. But if you ask them to change uh, their applications, they might they are they are concerned that they might uh, be delayed. So um, I wonder if a flexible approach can be adopted for extended urban districts applicants. If they if there are offers outside the extended urban districts, these offers can be also be given to them without causing any delay to the waiting time. For extended urban districts, I see that there are several thousand, and the majority of them waited for more than three or four years. The numbers uh, for this district is uh, much more serious than others. So, Director, would you uh, oversee this to prevent unfairness, Mr. Pascot? Um, extended urban district 4,100. That's total as at um, June 2013 from July 2012. And 2,400 waited for over three to four years. So. Proportion-wise, this is a fact for extended urban district. The waiting time is longer, Mr. Pascal. There's a couple of things there. Um, we do try to adopt the flexibility that you're talking about in terms of double flats for the, the biggest families. Obviously, uh, eight, nine, okay. ten people, we will definitely do that. It's a bit more difficult for the five, six people families because we should have units coming on stream for them. However, having said that, um, where we have got uh, particular cases, we, we, will ha we will always have a look at that. I think the other thing that, that I, I should say is that um, one of the issues that we're, we're going to have to address is uh, where the units are being built. And that, I think, will determine uh, whether that we have the flexibility that you've suggested. So we'll bear that in mind as we, as we review the exercise. Uh, from Kim Ge uh, Mr. Frederick Fong, Chairman. There are three problems with supply nowadays. First is in terms of quantity, 15,000 or below. Even with a few thousand more, um, well, discounting uh, CY Leung, comparing to Sikh Chung's era or um, Mr. Zhang's era, the housing production is very few. Um, I mean, every year there is a shortage of uh, 20,000. In Sikh Tong's era and Donald Zhang's era, the th situation was that every year there was a shortage of 20,000. And uh, Donald Zhang was the chief executive for seven years. And for housing production, in the coming three or four years, the units will mostly be produced in urban districts, which means, in retrospect, five or six years ago, there was surplus in a supply of land in the urban districts instead of the new territories. That means, in terms of planning, it had not been done properly. The majority of PRH production. was in urban district or in the new territories. Either way, that was wrong. It should be throughout the territory instead. So it was wrong planning five or six years ago. There was no coordination with the Development Bureau. The third point is about surplus. When I was an HA member, every year there were 20,000 vacant flats every year. Now only 7,000 or so. The whole policy is wrong. HA is an independent body and it can ask the government for land resources, for example, for additional manpower as well as resources for housing allocation. So my question is this. Now 
uh, P.S. You were either director or assistant director in the housing department back then, and did you ask for the government for resources on the three points I mentioned, Mr. Pascot? See, a lot of these are, de are development issues, um, which are not really strictly speaking under my control. But I can say that if you if you recall back in 1997. The commitment was to produce 80 odd thousand. That actually was achieved, for, I think, by the by 20, uh, sorry, 90, uh, 2002. We did produce 80 odd thousand, and because of that, the waiting average waiting time was brought down from over seven years to three years. That was an achievement of the previous governments. The issue now is that uh, we have not been able to increase the rate of production as quickly as we need to because the number of, un of people applying for the waiting list has grown dramatically just in the last two years. You can see that from the figures. On the QPS list, 40% plus 24% is a huge increase in the last two years. It takes time to change the direction of the ship when you're producing 15,000 on average to get it up to 20 or more takes time. Now, the commitment is already there. The chief executive has announced that at least we'll have to do 100,000 in the following five-year period. So the, the commitment is there, and we will be working on it. The, the, the surplus 20,000 of recycled units, which we used to have, was at a time when we were producing home ownership scheme, and we had other projects going on. At that time, you could recycle maybe eight or 9,000 just because of the home ownership scheme. So that's why it was a much bigger figure. The circumstances today are very, very different to what was happening even five years ago. Um. Mr. Fong, no time for you to follow up. So I will use my four minutes as a member to ask the administration questions as well, and then I will wrap up this item. I have several questions for the administration. The first one is about chart 25. In 2017-18, uh, about the project, of uh, housing in the new territories is zero. Why is that? There are a lot of applicants uh, opting for the new territories, right? And also, in relation to the district choices, um, there are um, urban district, extended urban district, new territories, and uh, outlying islands. Now, can that be divided, say, for the new territories, be divided to uh, new territories east, new territories west, or new territories north, so that you can get more matching cases? The new territories are so large, they may not uh, like the offer given. So when you do, when we do this adjustment. Final question. We now see that for those waiting for more than three years, I mean the eligible ones, 10,000 of them. Can the government target those who have waited for more than three years such that in future you can give them temporary housing? Without temporary housing, can you give them Rental subsidies. Three questions, Mr. Pescott, or who will answer? Let me deal with the, the production figures. Uh, that you're quite quite correct. We don't have any land, um, therefore no units in the NT for the next year. That's just the way the land production has has turned out. Uh, effectively, five years ago, that was the situation. Um, at the moment, however, I can say that looking forward, we're looking at at. Uh, new production in all urban areas, uh, extended urban areas, as well as new territories and even islands. So in the next few years, there will be a much better balance uh, across the whole production uh, program. In terms of um, the idea of dividing the new territories into, into smaller sections, maybe east and west, we, ha we have had this suggestion in the past. We, we've always taken the view that if we do that, it actually would cur curtail the, the selection, because at the moment people can select the, the new territories and it gives them more choice, because in the, in the main, most production has been in the last few years in the new territories. We've actually curtailed, in other words, we've restricted the number of people who can apply in the urban area and extended urban area up until very recently. So it's not something that we're currently planning to do, um, but I, I take your point that it, it, it's something perhaps we could consider when we get a more balanced production program in the future. 
and we can then consider you know, east-west if that's possible. Um, on your, uh, your idea of, of targeting people who've been on the waiting lists for a longer time, in fact, part of the exercise here has been to look at why people are spending longer time on the, on the, um, on the waiting list and if there is anything we can do to improve the offers that we can make to people so that they take up the offers. Because, of course, one of the big challenges is that people uh, are given three offers. They don't always accept the first offer. They don't always accept the second offer. In some cases, they're expecting the third offer to be better. But, of course, because it's a random selection process, there's no guarantee that the third offer will be any better than the first offer. So I think there is something here that we do need to look at in terms of how do we manage the waiting list to make it uh, a more effective way to, to, uh, to inform people how to, how to manage their circumstances. Sure. The government said that uh, in 2017-18, there would not be any supply of land sites. Now, this is a very serious message. I think uh, you should immediately go back uh, and discuss with the senior officials in the government. Because if you don't have any land sites in the new territories, it will be very, very serious, and it's rather regrettable. Anyway, I think we have to stop here for this particular item. Now, members, if we cannot finish the second item within the scheduled time, can I have an extension of 15 minutes? There's no objection. All right, so if necessary, we'll extend the meeting by 15 minutes. So let's continue. Yes, please invite the officials to come in. The fourth item is the construction project number B742 CL and the construction project number 56 CL. 文件係立法會文件 C B 括弧一一八四斜同一三一四括弧零五號文件，政府當局就工程計劃項目編號 B 七四二 C L 以東涌第五十六區建議發展項目有關嘅主要基礎建設工程，就歡迎政府當局咧就係係出席會議。咁咧就誒我節省時間，我唔一介紹啦嚇。咁咧就。Uh, Mr. Chairman, again, I'll, I'll do a very short introduction, then I'll hand over to Ada. Um, it's about, uh, this item is about the proposal to upgrade a, a project, main engineering infrastructure in association with the proposed development area 56 in Tung Chung. It's really about the engineering infrastructure to support the adjacent public housing development, including roads, drainage, sewage and water supply, uh, which are essential to allow the public housing development to go ahead. Upon completion, all of these works, which will be carried out by the Housing Department, would be handed over to the relevant Department for Management. Um, the Government has entrusted the Housing Authority, in this case the Housing Department, to design and construct the infrastructure to ensure better coordination with the adjoining public housing development. Um, to tie in with the scheduled completion and population intake of the public housing development in 2016, there's a need to provide the infrastructure in a timely manner, and we need uh, members' support and the funding approval from Finance Committee. If we get that, the construction work will commence in June of 2014, in time for completion in February of 2016. Um, I'll ask Ada to, to slightly quickly introduce the rest of the uh, details for members' consideration. Mr. Chairman, members, now I'd like to introduce to you the PWP item in relation to the main engineering infrastructure in association with Area 56 in Tongchong. This paper seeks member support on our proposal to upgrade B742CL to Category A for the design and construction of the engineering infrastructure for supporting the proposed housing developments at Area 56 in Tongchong. The site is to the northeast of the town centre of Chong Chong is Area 56. A road will be constructed to link up 
to the PRH development in Ariel 56. And for the road, its southern part will be linked up with Yingheng Road and Manhei Road Junction. This is to construct a new carriageway, pedestrian way, and cycle track, and to have drainage and water supply pipes, as well as the leisure, act, leisure facilities. This is for the PRH development at Area 56 to provide 3,600 units to house 10,000 people. In the middle of 2012, piling work started and the units will be completed by the end of 2016. To support the development plan and the intake date, we have to provide the infrastructure and to start work in June 2014 and to complete the project by February 2016. Cost $54 million. New carriageway, pavements, and cycle tracks. The drainage road works, uh, $16.6 million. Drainage and sewerage, $10.8 million. Water supply, $4.3 million. Environmental mitigation measure, $0.3 million. On cost, uh, $6.1 million. And contingencies, $4.4 million altogether 49.1 million we went to the traffic and transport committee of the islands district council and obtained their support and then on the 16th of february 2009 and the 20th of june 2011 we also consulted the islands district council on the 28th of september On CAP 370, we gazetted the project, and the Secretary for Transport and Housing authorized the proposed works without modification under the ordinance on the 21st of January. And the notice of authorization was gazetted on the 25th of January 2013. That's the implementation timetable. With member support, in December this year and January next year, will go to the PWSC and the FC respectively. Tendering February next year, works to start in June next year, and scheduled completion date February 2016. I urge members to support the project so that we can go to the PWSC for vetting. Just now is Ms. Ada Fung, the Deputy Director for Development and Construction, doing the PowerPoint presentation. If members are directly or indirectly related in terms of pecuniary interest, they should disclose the nature of the interest before they speak. And for ROP 84, there are certain requirements in relation to voting. If a certain member has direct pecuniary, pecuniary interest in the project. So, members were urged to say whether or not we support the project because they want to go to the PWSE. Mr. Ms. Alice Mack, Mr. Langkok Hong, Mr. Tony Zare would like to speak. If there are no other members, I can give you four minutes each. Ms. Alice Mack, Mr. Chairman, I support the project. When we have a new PRH estate, we of course need to have ancillary roads, otherwise the tenants may be affected. But I'd like to urge government departments to note that in new towns like Tung Chong and Tin Shui Wai, the roads built are very beautiful and straight. In Tung Chong and Tin Shui Wai, the motorists are very happy because there are very few traffic lights 
very few road junctions, but signage is very often not clear. The roads are so straight; it's very easy for motorists to speed. And when the residents don't have sufficient crossing facilities, traffic accidents may easily occur. Now, roads are straight and comfortable, but since they're so long and straight. The result is that not many people would like to walk on the pavements. So in new towns, very few people walk on the pavements. So you have to take note of that. Otherwise, you you always feel that there are not that many people in new towns. So apart from facilitating. Motorists, you really have to consider how to attract pedestrians to use pavements and walkways, and also cycle tracks have to be separated from pedestrian walkways and pavements. And you should attract more pedestrians to walk in new towns. Otherwise, the residents would rather take feeder. Transport rather than walk. So, in terms of engineering and design, you really have to think more of the pedestrians. Don't just think of the cyclists and motorists. Member, I think we do need to do more. It's it's a, it's very important that we don't repeat the mistakes that we made in some districts where there is no street level shops. There's nothing like that. So this is something that we're looking at. Perhaps Ada can give you a, a better example of what we're actually doing now. 看下風雨圈裏先。我係新設計嘅屋邨。For the new estates, we have shops on the roads, and for this Tongchong estate, we'll also have streets and shops. Pedestrians will be attracted to the shops. So, unlike other new towns. There'll be people on the streets of this particular estate. Yes, we'd like to have more people. So, on both sides of the roads, there'll be shops. I'd like to thank the departments for adopting our suggestions in street design. But of course, we only see the preliminary plans now. When we have more details, I hope you have more communication with the district councillors and local residents. Thank you, Chairman. Now, according to the paper, there were two public consultations in 2008 and 2009, respectively. Any paper to provide us in relation to the consultation exercises? I didn't quite pay attention to those. Now, Ms. Mack uh, made uh, a suggestion, and uh, perhaps those views had been expressed before. And uh, the administration peculiarly said that uh, they agree with uh, the members, but nothing is mentioned in the paper. If you really had this. Idea in mind in 2008, 2009, the local residents would have told you that as well, but nothing has been incorporated in the paper. Now about this infrastructure、uh, project seeking funding approval, any other developments nearby? Any、uh, residential developments nearby? I the, the、um, map、um, contains small print, and I can't see clearly. If there are developments nearby, then、uh, you're cheating us. We provide funding for all the infrastructure, for transportation access, and then we are the pioneers, just like Chen Kuan O for a decade. We build all the infrastructure and transportation. We build covered walkway, and、uh, who stand to benefit? So about area 56. Apart from PRH, in the neighboring areas,、uh, any other projects? I'll ask Ada to, to contribute.、Um, the 
as you can see from this plan, it's probably the best plan for you. To uh, okay. At, you can see that the area is already partially developed. Yeah. What we're, what we're, we're talking about are, are the facilities that primarily will be used uh, for the public housing estate. But yes. let me say, invariably, when we come to, mo to most new town developments, the public housing goes in first anyway. But usually, it's um, when we're putting it in, the infrastructure development will be carried out by the relevant government departments. The reason that we're doing this is that we think it's more efficient because it can be done as a package so that we, we control the pace to make sure it's de delivered on time so that when we're ready to uh, complete the, the housing element, all the other bits are in place. So it, it just makes sense to approach it that way. Do you want to add something to it, Ada? Uh, okay. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Director. A brief response, as you can see in the plan, Area 56 is a PRH development. 55B, 55A will be private residential developments. Bingo! So there will be two schools in Area 89, and the road can provide access to the schools. Well, so bingo, Chairman. I guessed right. So in the name of PRH development, we provide funding for all the infrastructure facilities. That's the development mode of Hong Kong. Well, you should ask those private developers to do it themselves first. So the question is, the housing department is proposing to uh, c carry out carry it out that way. So is the government responsible for building roads for people to speculate in the property market? Yeah, would like to. Yes, the uh, public facility, Mr. Chairman. I think public Where facilities, public? by definition, are public facilities. They're not restricted to any one user or otherwise. The development of roads, etc., within a private site, are the responsibility of the private developers. But these are common areas that are available for use to the public as a whole. I don't think there's anything incompatible with that. Mm. Oh. Yes, please supplement. Mr. Wong, Mr. Kenneth Wong, Chief Civil Engineer from Housing Department. Now we're talking about the north side of L16. For the south end of L16, it is mainly for providing access to the, de the development at Area 55B. And this stretch of the road According to the um, these uh, land sale condition in May 2010, this stretch will be constructed by the private developer of 55B. What we do now is to connect the uh, south of L16 to the north side of L16 for PRH development. Mr. Long, your question has been answered. No, he hasn't. There will be underground for, uh, utilities, cables, uh, etc. Underground. All right, I'll save the argument. Well, let me say a few words as well. As a former councillor in New Territories West, I can confirm that this project is for the use by this PRH development because there are already private developments in the vicinity. Next, Mr. Tony Chair. I support this project. Roads are necessary for any development, be it private or public housing development. Road, infrastructure roads are necessary. Uh, for example, for private developments, if there is access by roads, definitely it will be reflected in the price. And um, Ms. Alice Mack just now already made this point in relation to pedestrians. Or, well, I see that cycle track is proposed, and I also hope the administration would uh, pay attention to that, and greening should also be done. Chairman, this is a small community, and the transport f uh, frequent within the community. So 
more weight should be given at a detailed desi design stage to this aspect. There will be two schools in Area 89, as you said just now, so there will be uh, students. So uh, please take note of that. For cycle tracks, is it part of a network? Apart from Area 89, does it also connect to Area 55 as well? Thank you, Chairman. Any response? Mr. Wong, thank you, Chairman. Uh, next to road, um, I mean, L16 will be lined with planters. We have 24 trees and also 4,800 shrubs. As for cycle track, it will lead all the way from L16 to Yinghei Road and Mantong Road, uh, the jun junction of these two. And uh, cyclists can cross this junction because it's a light control junction. And then from Yinghei Road, uh, they can then carry on the journey on the existing cycle track, which leads all the way to the MTR station. Next step to Chairman Mr. Wu Chi Wai. Thank you, Chairman. I'd like to ask about transport facilities. According to this plan, Area 56 will be the uh, final stop of the uh, North Lantau Link or North Lantau Highway. So will this serve as a bus terminus for buses traveling uh, on North Lantau Highway, or will they need to go uh, about a roundabout before they can exit the highway, Mr. Wong? Now, on transportation, we are in close liaison with the transport department. In Tongchung North of Lantau, uh, there are several bus routes available. Um, one uh, S56, one thirty-seven. Um, the former one is to the airport. The second one is from the Caribbean coast to the town center of Tongchong to MTR station, and then uh, to Yatong Estate. And uh, across the district, they also have E21A to Homan Tin via North uh, Mong Kaok, and E31 to Chinwan. And during uh, morning peak hours, um, there is also another bus route to Tin Hao MTR station. So we discussed with the transport department, and the preliminary suggestion is during the intake of Area 56 of Tongchong, they can adjust the service routes. These routes run along the north side of Tongchong, and uh, every year they have a franchise bus route development program, uh, which they would consult with the district councils to make sure that the sufficient bus routes travel in this district. As for hardware, as you can see in the plan, there are many laybys along L16. Um, with a stretch of about 100 meters, so there will be sufficient space for bus stops to be erected. Thank you. Of course, I understand that they can adjust bus routes within the network to resolve the problem. But my point is, if this estate will be situated at the exit of the highway, then where the design is possible, you should consider providing direct um, cross-district transport. I'm not talking about new bus routes. I'm talking about facilities, rather, say, bus terminus so that, or bus stops at least, for bus going out to Kowloon to stop here, rather than making a detour, rather than making the bus routes so unpopular so that you won't face a lot of complaints of poor bus service. The other point I'd like to know is this. Would you expect residents living here to take the MTR or take the buses, Mr. Wong? As I said just now, along the highway there are laybys which can serve as bus stops or bus terminals. Of course, we need to discuss with the Transport Department on the arrangement of bus routes.
by then. Back to your question, if they, uh, if residents would like to go directly to the MTL station, there is an existing bus route number 37 that goes from Caribbean coast to the MTL station. So that can serve as the feeder service. If they want to go directly to Mong Kok, however, they can take E22A, uh, and there is also a bus stop nearby to Mong Kok. So there are different options for them. Chairman, I understand. So I, but uh, please uh, provide the uh, trans uh, or traffic report or traffic layout for our reference. You should prepare a traffic layout or traffic plan to avoid complaints from residents. Thank you, Chairman. So please uh, take note of this issue and see if you can supply any. Uh, supplementary information. Dr. Kwakaki, I support this project. I have several questions. The first is about the uh, construction timetable and the completion date. Now, we like to see the PRH developments, including the one in Area 56, completed as soon as possible. Now, after funding is approved at FC, is there any room for works to be expedited? Second question, Mr. Wu Chi Wai asked a question just now. Let me put it in another way: Is there a um, uh, service? Uh, is there a road leading directly to the North Lantau Highway from Area 56, so that in the future uh, there might be f um, special routes from uh, franchise bus companies or GMBs going to the town center of Tong Chong, so that residents living in Area 56 will not uh, need to uh, make detours. The third question is about cycle tracks. You say that it will lead to Yinghe Road. Will it continue to go northwards or eastward along the waterfront? Is that the existing design? Three questions. Mr. Wong. Thank you, Chairman. Now, on the planning of works, according to the present progress, we expect to commence in the middle of 2014 for completion in the beginning of 2016. Now, PRH development at Area 56, the intake we expect to will, will take place um, in February 2016. So. The uh, infrastructure roles would have been co completed. Can you expedite the progress of PRH production? We have tried to compress the timetable as much as we can. That's the time needed for the public works. What about the second and third questions? Second question for Tung Chung Area 56. One, you're out of L56 when you reach the junction of Yinghe Road and Mantong Road. You can turn left into Yinghe Road and then you can turn to Yi Tong Road and then turn directly into North Lantau Expressway. So it's a very direct and short route. So will that be your blueprint? That is, in future, motorists will have to reach Area 56 first? Well, we'll still have to work out the details. At the moment, most bus routes start from Yatong Estate, where there is a big bus terminus. As bus routes tend to be long, they first come out to take on passengers from Caribbean coast before leaving. So it's a rather direct route. Of course, we don't rule out the possibility of a more direct route in future. We still have to work out the details with the transport department. Every year, the transport department discusses the bus route development program with district councils concerned. For the cycle track, yes, there is one in Yinghe Road. When they run leftwards and westwards, 
they have to cross a pedestrian footbridge, which can allow bicycles to pass through, and then they can reach the town centre. Mr. Chairman, I'm asking about the Yamo bound traffic. Well, we're not developing Yamo yet. Perhaps I should refer to the CEDD for supplementary information. Please be brief. In fact, in Tongchong and the extension of the new Tongchong town to the east of Area 56, all along to Suhoan and Yamo, we do have minor projects. And we've already reserved land for a cycle track for those three locations. Well, so much for this discussion. Members, do you support uh, this project so that they can go to the PWSE? Yes, sir. Uh, what would you like to say? I hope that uh, when they go to the PWSC, we can have uh, more information in terms of traffic and transport. For example, we want to know the alignment of the roads. And please consider a pedestrian system in Area 56 so that pedestrians can cross the MTR railway tracks. Well, to sum up, uh, this panel supports the project, so you can go to the PWSG. As for the information requested by members, I hope that the government will supply the information before the PWSC meeting. Oh, yes, they have already promised to do so. All right, item six on the agenda. Any other business? No? All right, meeting adjourned. Thank you very much.